You may be seated. Good to be here with you. Um, you know, I was flying the other day, and uh, I was thinking about this on the airplane. Isn't it amazing how you can uh, sit on an airplane as you're traveling 30,000 feet up in the air, going from one point to another, and uh, you're able to read a book, watch a movie, have a conversation with somebody, because there's someone that's uh, driving that plane, right? There's someone driving that plane. And when it comes to life, I, I, was, I, I was thinking that's, that's the case sometimes is, you know, I have to be reminded that, uh, that I don't have to be driving the plane, that I can sit back, that I can relax, that I can enjoy life in the moment because there's someone who's in charge of that plane. And it's not me. And I, I, I'm always reminded that most of the problems and the troubles that I have in life is when I'm trying to be a backseat driver to God in my life and I'm looking over his shoulders when I'm not qualified to fly a plane. I'm not qualified to fly a plane. Let him do it. Let him do it. This is what this passage is about. This passage that we read is part of the Sermon of the Mount. It's the most important body of teachings of Jesus. And in this sermon that Jesus preaches, he is trying to give us a picture of what this new life he's calling us to live ought to look like, the life in the kingdom. And, you know, as we think about this topic of God being in control uh, and, you know, People have experienced God's control in their lives in different ways. Uh, glad for Irene's story of how she was able to rest that God was in control. I mean, his timing was perfect. And, you know, he was bringing something beautiful into her story for his honor and his glory to encourage and to build others in the future. I think that we were built today by hearing and listening to her story. But as we think about this topic of God being in control, I want to look underneath the hood and, and, and think about why is God in control, right? Uh, some of us get turned off this idea of any type of being in our lives that's in control of things. We're uncomfortable with that, especially us Westerner types that value freedom. But I like us to look underneath the surface. Why, why is God actually in control? And, and here is the, the simplest answer, and we'll break it down this morning. He, he's in control for our own good, for our own good. See, I want us to look at the fact that God desires us to live a certain way of, of life. God has a, a specific way that he wants us to live. It's for our good. So let's look at that, the life that God desires us to live. Then, then, let's, then let's look into what keeps us from living this life that God wants us to live. And then lastly, how, how do we live this life that God wants us to live? Uh, let's start with the life that God desires us to live. Now, Jesus is a master uh, speaker, a master illustrator of truths, and everything that Jesus speaks and every image that he brings forth in his, spe in his speech or in his teachings, he is trying to convey a body of truth, and he does it always in a very powerful way. I don't know if you noticed this as we were reading the text, but there's two images uh, of this life that God wants us to live here in this passage. Uh, the first one is... Uh, and the birds of the air. It's, a, it's, an, it's an image of freedom. The, the first uh, way that God wants us to live this life that he's gifting us is a, it's a life of freedom. He wants your life to be characterized by freedom. He says, look at the birds of the air. Think about birds of the air, because they're birds of the ground as well. You know, they're birds of the ground like chickens. See, God is saying, I don't want you to live like a chicken that has a limited view, negative, always looking down, pecking at things. I want you to live like the birds of the air. You know, we're blessed to live in a city uh, where we see beautiful birds all around us. I would imagine that in Jesus' days when he was teaching this, there were no macaws flying over their heads, but there are macaws that fly over our heads here in Miami. We're blessed to see macaws and we're blessed to see parrots in the city that we live in. And, and these birds give us a, a beautiful picture of what freedom looks like. You know, uh, when we were living in Palmetto Bay, I had this red macaw uh, that would come into our backyard and would rest on one of the branches of our tree that sits behind our pool. Uh, that would probably happen once or twice a week, depending on the time of the year. And I always wanted to find a way to have that bird come every single afternoon because they're beautiful. They're loud, but they're, they're beautiful. And, uh, and so I, I was reading, you know, blogs and how, how, do you, how, do you, how do you keep these birds in? How do you invite them to come back tomorrow? You know, what do you feed them? And it's so hard. This 
probably nothing that you can do because those birds sit so high up on tree branches that, you know, they're not even interested in what you mere humans do at the surface level of the earth. And, and so there was nothing that I could keep doing to bring that bird back. The bird would choose to be there whenever it wanted. Because birds like that, they're free. They're not bound to a specific ge geography. If they need to migrate to eat or to breed, they'll do that as well. And this is the image of the life that God wants you to live, a life from above, a life that's free. Not like chickens, but like macaws, a life of freedom. And he also wants you to live a life of beauty. Look at the second imagery in the passage here. It says, consider the lilies of the field. And I want to highlight the lilies of the field. Because some of you have lilies in your balcony. Some of you have lilies inside your homes that you water, that you control, that you position accordingly to the sunlight. But they're lilies of the field. And what Jesus means is this is not a produced type of beauty. You can't control. These are these are. Uh, plants. These are flowers that grow naturally, right? There's no one showing up to water those flowers. There's no sh one showing up to position those flowers accordingly to the sunlight. It's organic. It's natural. Now think about this. We live in a city that's about controlled beauty, right? There's a lot of talk and a lot of opportunities for us to control our image. There are doctors and, and helpers that will put you through treatments and under a knife so that your beauty is controlled. There's stores that you can go to and dress so that you're able to control your image. And Jesus is saying, the life that I want to offer you, it's a natural life. It's a life of freedom. It's a life of beauty that's not produced. It comes from within. It's the life that I live myself. And here's the connection between this life that Jesus wants us to live is you know, the more reliant we are on God, right, the freer we will be and the more attractive our lives will become. Here's the connection to this life of freedom. It's connection to God. It's dependence on God. It's reliance on God, which means that what keeps us from living this life is disconnection from God. It's a life characterized what Jesus says here, anxiety. And three times in this passage, Jesus says, don't be anxious. Don't be anxious. And he closes off this body of teaching by saying in verse 34, do not be anxious. What is anxiety? In, in summary, just be very brief, anxiety is worrying about the potential and not the actual. Look at verse 34 of what Jesus says here, the last verse. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own troubles. You know, what is anxiety? You're worrying about what's going to happen tomorrow when you have no control over tomorrow. Jesus says you can't even control the present much less control the future. Why are you worrying about controlling the future? See, anxiety is an attempt to control that which is uncontrollable. And it's triggered by two things. It's triggered by false beliefs and it's triggered by false hopes. Every time that you experience anxiety, right, it, it's either, unless it's like me, like you, when you drink too much coffee in the morning, um, it's usually because you uh, have some sort of false beliefs underneath the surface or false hopes that's triggering that anxiety. Number one, it's, it's triggered by false hopes. It's this illusion that we carry that God is not in control of things. You know, there's something deeply embedded into our hearts sometimes when, you know, we see life unfolding before us. And it's not exactly the way that we want it. That God is not in control of things. That is a false belief. That's a false belief. Jesus is with the crowd when he's teaching this and he's telling them, just look. He's pointing to nature. Look at the world. Does it seem like things are spinning out of control? Look at the birds. They're not working. They don't have a job description. They're not saving up in the barns their food. And yet there's food for them every day. The lilies are not worried about the sunlight. And they're not worried about who is uh, watering them or not. Because God waters them and God clothes them. When you look at the world, you know, there is no other truth but the fact that God is running things pretty well. The problems that we have in the world are caused by us, 
But God is doing his job. And that's what Jesus is saying. That is a false belief. Every time that you allow yourself to think and to, and, and to dwell in that thought that God is not in control, that will trigger anxiety in your life. It will trigger, anxiety will be triggered in your life when you think that you're also in control, which, by the way, you're not. All it takes is going to the doctor and getting a diagnosis that you did not expect or being fired from a boss or a relationship falling apart right in front of you. You know that you are not in control of things. The worst thing that we sometimes do is try to control our lives in order to control God's opinions, uh, God's opinion of us or God's favor over us or God's blessing over our lives. And Jesus reminds us that we are not in control. Just look at life. That's a false belief. We are also triggered by false hopes. Our anxiety is triggered by false hopes. You know, false hopes are things that we all tend to look at and to in order to find significance, security, and value and meaning for our lives. Jesus gives us two examples here when he talks about the Gentiles. In verse 32, he says this, for the Gentiles seek after all these things. What are all these things that Jesus is talking about? He's mentioning two particular things. First, Jesus is talking about food, and then uh, Jesus is talking about clothing. And what Jesus is really talking about is not an overconcern about food because you need to survive or uh, an overconcern over clothes because you don't have what to wear, but he's talking about the need that we all have underneath all these needs, which is to find comfort and also to rely on our image for things. You know, the idea of food, meaning, you know, we go to certain things for comfort, and then we go to certain things as well for image. Now, we live in a culture that idolizes both comfort and image. And the mere thought for people like ourselves that live in a city like Miami to have to downsize, right, or to lose any sort of comfort or to have any taint in our image, right, it is a, it is a death sentence, right, for you to gain weight here in Miami. It is a death sentence for you to age, for you to lose any control over your image or your comfort. And Jesus is saying, you know, if that is the case with anything in life, and, and these two things in particular, right, you have looked at things other than God for your comfort and your security, for meaning and significance in life. And that's the reason for your anxiety because as soon as these things are under threat, you feel that your life is completely falling apart. An illustration of that is how many of you have seen the Lord of the Rings? Remember that, that character in the Lord of the Rings, Gollum? That stressed out creature by the name of Gollum. He's always worried about the ring. He's always saying, my precious, my precious, my precious, my precious. But think about Gollum. Gollum didn't start as Gollum. He started as a nice little hobbit by the name of Smeagol that ran into this ring that he found in the bottom of this creek. And his relationship with that ring became dysfunctional because that ring became his source of significance and meaning in life. And he couldn't see himself without the ring. And his obsession to that ring or the idea that he may lose the ring turned him into Gollum. See, that, that's what anxiety does to us. Anxiety not only makes us unattractive people, we become the parents that children don't want to have. We become the spouse that, it, that people don't want to have. We become the co-workers that no one wants to work with because anxiety has destroyed our lives. Anxiety has made us into slaves. It has that power. And so then Jesus comes in here with this body of teaching and he offers us hope of how to live this life of freedom and beauty, a life that's free of anxieties. He says here, look at the birds and consider the lilies of the field. See, when Jesus says look and consider, what Jesus is saying here is he wants you to spend some time reflecting upon the realities of life. You need to be reminded of certain truths that can offer you hope so that you don't have to be a slave to anxiety. And you don't have to deteriorate or be deformed by a life that's characterized by anxiety. He wants us to consider, number one, God as a father. 
See, there's two ways to relate to God. There's God as a boss and God as a father. You know, when you look at God as a boss, you know, provision is conditioned upon performance because that's how you relate to a boss. You know, you get a paycheck at the end of the month if you perform. Provision condition by performance. And many of us have this type of relationship with God. We're always bargaining, negotiating with God because we see God as this boss, right, that rewards us according to how well we perform in life. And what Jesus is saying here, he says, little children, little children, look at your father in heaven. He wants you to change and shift your image and idea of God. God is a father. And a father provides not based on your performance but based on the relationship. Based on love. See, your kids can disobey you and you'll still provide them food every single day and shelter and school and care. And that's the type of relationship that God has with us. Regardless of our disobedience, regardless of our lack of trust and faith in him, he still has vowed to take care of our basic needs. And he wants us to consider, and I, here's what's in the passage here is powerful, not just the fact that he is a father, not just that he is a God that is in control of the universe, but he's involved in our lives because he's a father. But he wants us to consider the way in which we have become children. See, somehow we have this wrong notion that every single person is a child of God. We're not. The reason why God has a special care towards his children is because we have been adopted into his family. Now, the means of his adoption has been the performance of Jesus Christ. You know, it's interesting here in verse 33 that he says, seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added into you. I was thinking about this verse and thinking, you know, so if I want God's provision over my life, if I want God's care in my life, I have to put him first, right? That's what we think. But here's the problem. None of us, not even me, we're always putting God first in our lives. We put other things first. The things that give us security and comfort and meaning, right, that feeds into our image and feeds into our comfort. Those are the things that we put first in our lives. And yet God still blesses me. Why? Why does God still have a care as a father has for a child over my life when I don't put him first? Because there was one that put him first, and that was Jesus Christ. Jesus was the only one that fully put God first. He put God first. And, and, and what happened to his life? Was he blessed? That all these, were all these things added to him? No. His life fell apart. His life was crushed. But why was his life crushed if he put God, his father, first? So that when we don't put God first, our life will not fall apart, but that our life will thrive in return. It's only because of Jesus that we have access. I want you to ponder this. It's because of Jesus that God is committed to caring for you, and he loves you in the same way that he loves his only begotten son. Nothing can change that. And this is what you must do, therefore. You must ask God to speak to you, You need to learn how to pray Psalm 139, where the psalmist, in the last verse of Psalm 139, says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there are any grievous way in me. You need to go to God, and you need to say, God, search my heart, and show me the things that I'm going to for hope. What are my false hopes? What are the false beliefs that are guiding my life? You need to ask God to show you that. You need to learn how to pray that. Because you need to break the chain from these false beliefs. And you need to break the chain from these false hopes that are taking your life down and causing you to be, causing you to be anxious. And then you got to speak to your heart. That's the second thing you must do. you got to speak to your heart. The reason why you, you feel that your heart is coming out of your mouth is because your heart is doing a lot of talking. Sometimes you got to look at your heart and say, shut up. Shut the heck up. I'm going to preach some truth to you, heart. Because that's what the psalmist is always doing. You need to do like the psalmist in Psalm 42. He says, why are you downcast, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God. Stop hoping at work. Stop hoping in your image. Stop hoping in your sources of comfort. Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. And then thirdly, you need to listen to others. That's the importance of church and why you can't live faith alone. You need to have people speak into your lives. You need to be honest and vulnerable with them, and you need to allow them to look into your heart and your life and say, maybe you're giving too much attention to this, and you shouldn't trust God. You need church because of that. You need me. You need other, the others who are in the room because of that. Listen to others. And then, only then, will you be able 
to put him first. Um, I'll close with this story. Uh, Queen Elizabeth of England, at one point, she invites this merchant to go out and explore the new world for her. And he says to her, well, Queen, I can't do that because I just started a business. If I go out and I start exploring for you, uh, my business is going to die. You know what the queen told him? He says, you worry about my business and I worry about yours. You know, that's the same thing with God. You worry about his business and he will worry about yours. I want to challenge you with that. Let's pray. Father, you have vowed that you will take care of our business if we take care of yours. Father, allow us to see Jesus so that we can take care of your business. Uh, Father, allow us to put Jesus first. He is first. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you, church.